Great, great to be here and uh, looking forward to a fun, uh, fun conversation. It's been fun to see some uh, familiar faces, uh, uh, folks like Mitch Caper, who was actually the uh, original first outside investor in rural networks back in 1995, uh, and some other folks here, uh, Bing, who uh, uh, had, uh, was spoke earlier, uh, and uh, see Don Levinsky uh, hopping around out here somewhere. So it's great to, great to see some old friends and meet some new uh, fellow loves as well. So I'm going to just give you a, do a quick uh, summary of uh, uh, who I am and my, my, my background. Uh, I uh, grew up in New York. Uh, I started at Yale 35 years ago, which is a number that scares me, uh, but it's mathematically correct. Uh, I uh, did my first company, started my first company while I was at Yale uh, in the fall of 81. I worked for IBM the summer the IBM PC came out, uh, and uh, it was a great place, right place, right time kind of thing. Started a company that made games for the IBM PC. We started working on them in the fall of my junior year. Uh, took the summer off the, the, uh, and uh, and uh, finished the games and distributed them nationally uh, with a couple of classmates. Learned a bunch about business uh, and uh, had some fun doing it. It, was, it compared favorably to a summer job, but it was not going to be that company was not going to be a, a rocket ship for many many reasons. I figured there was a lot I had to learn, and it turned out to be correct. Uh, so I finished in 83 with a BS in CS and a, a Master in Economics, so I kind of had a technical and a kind of a, a class as far as a business background coming out of, out of Yale. Uh, and then I spent 10 years at this little software company called Microsoft, and I remember uh, my mom was from uh, California, she still lives just north of here in Petaluma. Uh, so, but we were living in New York at the time, and when I first talked about moving west, uh, I remember explaining to her that there's a little company, about 250 people, and I was young and I could afford to take a risk, and if it didn't work out, I'd do something else. Uh, and so I know that you all grew up in a world where the notion of Microsoft being a risky place to go uh, is, uh, is kind of a crazy idea, but uh, 30, 31 years ago, that was, the, uh, that was the way people thought of it. Not many people had heard of it, certainly not people that were involved in technology. Uh, and I had a fantastic 10 year ride there, learned a ton. Uh, then I started Real Networks 20 years ago, actually incorporated in February of uh, 94, so just a little over 20 years ago. Uh, and had a great ride, which I'll talk a little about, and I've got back on the horse about two years ago. So, uh, and you uh, can tell I talk fast, so we got through that in hopefully 90 seconds. So the first uh, five years or so of Real Network really was a rocket ship ride. Uh, we introduced the internet's first streaming audio system, and then one of the first uh, video systems. Uh, we were both a, a consumer products and technology, and it was a phenomenal. Uh, growth curve, uh, uh, 1.8 million, 14 million, 32, 65, 130, 240, uh, plus or minus. Uh, 240 is interesting though because the first half of that year, we also did 130, so we were doubling every year. And then the second half of that year, we could see things were changing. Uh, uh, last week we talked about uh, getting out of Yale right around the time the tech bubble burst. Um, I remember that time very vividly, as you could imagine. Uh, we also were hit by a telecom bubble burst in which we sold a lot of software into the telecom world. And also Microsoft, ironically, was starting to uh, violate antitrust laws now they competed with us. And while we ended up uh, settling with them very favorably uh, some years later for about three quarters of a billion dollars, uh, the short term impact was quite negative as you, as you see there uh, on, uh, on our, our, our revenues and, and some other pieces as well. So we had to reinvent the company. And I, in some time, I won't talk about the details of that reinvention, but I will show you the result. Uh, we continued to, after about th uh, three years, we revitalized the company, reinvigorated the growth, and uh, got over half a million dollars in revenue uh, by 2008, uh, which of course was when the Great Recession hit. It was actually a, a few different things happened at that time. Uh, after running Real for about 16 years, uh, I had kids later in life. Uh, they're all great now, but uh, uh, I wanted to shift gears for a variety of reasons. I have twins that are now seven and a half and an almost four year old. So I, I, after 16 years, I stepped back from day to day. Uh, we uh, Mitch fired from hiring my successor, uh, unfortunately twice. Uh, so that was uh, not the ideal way to create uh, create value in the company. Uh, about two years ago, in the spring uh, of 2012, the board came to me and asked me if I would consider. Uh, I'd stayed on the board, uh, but consider getting more involved. Uh, and uh, in uh, uh, in the uh, uh, July 2012, so a little less than two years ago, I got back involved. Uh, initially just for a couple of months to sort of see kind of what we had and come up with some thoughts on where we go next and uh, ended up presenting them to the board uh, a couple months in uh, to meet with the team and kind of figure out where we should go. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today and sort of the pivot that we're actually frankly right now in the middle of uh, as I talk to you today. So in, this is from literally the text from slides uh, from uh, early September of 2012, so after I've been back about two months. Um, 
we basically made the first macro decision, which is you have to decide are you do you do one thing or you have multiple things you're doing. We decided to radically decentralize the company uh, at that time uh, and focus on four things. One, we'd actually already spun off our stake in the Rhapsody Music Service. We own about 45% of it as, as we did at the time. Um, and then we had three other divisions that we ended up deciding the best thing to do was to create optimal end-to-end -end, uh, technology, product, go-to-market business and sales strategy for each of them. So we decentralized the company quite significantly at the time. Uh, we decided to run each business in an independent way um, and would allocate resources based on the combination of the prospects we thought it would have for success and, and uh, actually the results it achieved. Um, and then we ended up uh, uh, closing down, uh, 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 spinning off in a few cases, shutting down a few cases, uh, or integrating into some of the mothership uh, businesses, the rest of what we're doing. So we refocused the company significantly. Uh, and, uh, and then we decentralized. So no more central technology group, no more central marketing group, um, and uh, every 95% of the staff of the company either worked for uh, or was seconded to one of the operating divisions. So we then thought, okay, well that's that's half of it, then you actually have to have strategy for each of the businesses. So for the three main businesses, we created strategies to take the real player, which was and is continued to be a very popular software soft on the PC, but had very little presence uh, on, on mobile devices, on clouds, on televisions, and grow, go very broadly cross-platform with that. Uh, we took our carrier services business, which was called a SaaS business, um, and decided, hey, carriers are good at selling some stuff, but they're really bad at selling consumer products on smartphones. So let's move into a different model around that uh, and create products and services that we will market ourselves in partnership with carriers. Uh, we now call that model carrot, or carrier enabled over the top. Uh, but at the time, the idea was just, hey, we've got to, we have this, all these great products that aren't getting into market, we've got to change how we're doing business. And then we have a games division, which is our smallest division, we focused on uh, doing some innovations around uh, social casino uh, games in that business. So, we're on the clock for today, uh, 18 months later, and the strategy we're on is fundamentally the strategy we set in motion in the fall of 2012, which I think is a good thing, in the fullest of time we'll know for sure, but we didn't, uh, didn't uh, keep uh, iterating. We, uh, change direction, set sail, and started sailing. You know, these products, they have an incubation period, a gestation period. Uh, it takes time to build them. You know, nine women can't have a baby in a month kind of thing. So we ended up, some of the names of the products changed. The cloud platform Real Player is known as Real Player Cloud. We renamed the SaaS division Mobile Entertainment to focus on the kinds of products and services we're creating. Uh, the, we had the, the first product that integrates carriers with this direct-to-consumer is called Listen. It's a direct-to-consumer. Uh, advanced running back to home product and service. Uh, and then we did a series of, of products and games that are in the interest of time. I won't talk much about the games issues, although they were still important to us. And we just hired a phenomenal guy to run that division about a month ago. So if I look at how we're doing today, there's a lot of good news and, and there's some not so good news, as you'd imagine in this kind of situation. First, the good news is uh, we're building and shipping great products again. For companies like ours, products are the lifeblood of the company. They're great products. And you know, in the short term, you can kind of squeak by, but in the long term, nothing else matters. And so we revitalized the product culture, a combination of bringing some new people in, in a few cases, bringing some people back, in a few cases, promoting and increasing responsibilities of some of the people that I, I thought really had the right kind of DNA to make great products and services. Uh, and we, by and large, succeeded in doing that. Uh, we succeeded also with some of our major initiatives where we really wanted to be first to market. While we do have some competitive advantages, being first to market is much better than chasing somebody else. It's just cloning somebody else, if you're super big and you have an existing platform like Amazon, Amazon can be, doesn't have to be first, go, first going into selling makeup online. They've got a huge customer base, they can leverage that. Um, well, we have a decent uh, install base of things like the Real Player and our 18 million customers that uh, around the world that are subscribers to bring back home services with carriers. Uh, we don't think those advantages were so big that they substitute for, uh, that, that not being first mover uh, is an important. So we wanted to have and we were able to reserve first mover in those initiatives. Uh, and our products are resonating with consumers. And just to touch on a few of them, um, a real player cloud is probably the single most important issue of the company. Uh, I'm kind of curious in this group, uh, raise your hand if in the last year you've used either real player cloud or uh, a real player on one of your devices. Uh, we've got a few hands, we've got more work to do obviously. Uh, well the good news is we're up to two million uh, registered users in six months. Uh, which we're very excited about. Uh, uh, it's really quite, it's a global footprint, about half of that's in the US. Um, and uh, we've, we, uh, we're now on about 10 different devices, uh, uh, every kind of PC, you know, Mac, uh, 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 
um, a web device, uh, iPhone, Android, both tablets and phones, uh, three or four different TV devices, uh, Roku, Chromecast, and we just recently shipped on the Amazon Fire TV product. Uh, the reviews have been terrific. Uh, Walt Mossberg, uh, you know, uh, famously tough on products, uh, wrote here, said, Real Player Cloud is well designed and makes storing and sharing videos easier across different devices. Uh, we have a technology called Short Play that makes sure that the video you upload can play anywhere, uh, and that's working well. Uh, so we're, we're off the race with this product. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, we have to increase its virality, <coughs> which is, you know, we've laid the foundation for that, but the way network effects kick in, you've got to get to some scale in order to have that. We have to keep innovating. Uh, we have a roadmap of things we want to do in the next year. Uh, we're going to keep putting iterations out. Uh, one of the things we changed about the company is we moved to basically from, from waterfall type software development to pretty much full scrum in everything we do. So we iterate and, and are, are getting our new products out very fast. Uh, to get a product of this magnitude out in a year, basically from when we hit the start button and launched in September, October of last year, uh, we're super happy with how fast we went, but we have to keep moving fast. It's a market are very competitive as, as everyone here obviously knows. The second product, which just launched in the US last month, uh, is called Listen. Uh, if you're on T-Mobile, it's available now. Download it, try it, check it out. It's a next generation ring back tone product. Um, we, it's, it's frankly, uh, ring back tone barely touches the, the scratch the surface of what it is. We uh, allow, we have this uh, uh, relationship with carriers where we can insert things in the call path. So when, when you call me, you don't necessarily just hear ring, ring, you hear what I want you to hear, which could be music, it could be, hey, I'm in a meeting, call me back, uh, I'll call you back in an hour, hey, I'm in a meeting, send me a text. You know, it could be, uh, you know, if, you're, if your girlfriend calls, uh, it could be, you know, hey, uh, would you pick up a, 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 a loaf of bread? Uh, I forgot to, you know, you can, you can put whatever you want in that call path, uh, in, in music, audio, notification messages, et cetera. And we're just building that out with really good apps for smartphones. We have both iPhone and Android versions of those apps. We market the service ourselves. There was a great discussion a couple sessions ago on how you do SEM and direct to, direct to uh, end user consumer marketing. Carriers typically aren't good at that. They have some structural advantages. They have the billing relationship with you, which we leverage. They have the phone number, which we leverage. Uh, they have the point of sale distribution, which we uh, leverage. But in terms of really getting out there and being scrappy and creative and marketing all the different touch points to consumers, uh, typically carriers don't have that DNA and that skill set. So the fact that we are not taking this on ourselves sets us up to be successful. Very early days yet, but I feel good about the trajectory this is on. We're also in the market in the UK and we're rolling out to carriers around the world. Uh, the not as good news, uh, the first point is that the turnaround is going to take longer than we originally thought. Uh, uh, we did an earnings call yesterday and we sort of said as much, or David Richardson, we sort of said as much that we think it's going to take a couple quarters longer than we wanted it to. Uh, and that's a combination of sort of the physics of these things. Uh, related to that, it's going to end up costing a little more than we thought. Now, in hindsight, both those things are predictable. If you've ever been involved in building new products, building new businesses, things always take longer than what you thought. And I, I, you have to differentiate one of the things in, in this kind of role between signal and noise, which is to say when a delay is a, uh, a one-time offset versus is a structural problem, like you're not building the software fast enough or you're not closing sales fast enough. And one of the things that is very hard to teach entrepreneurs um, is when to signal uh, check or pattern match the difference between something that's moving more slowly because of one-time offsets versus something that's moving more slowly because of a more structural or fundamental issue. And I feel good that, fun, that big picture, we're on the right track in both of these initiatives, uh, as well as some other initiatives that in the interest of time I'm, I'm not uh, touching on today. Uh, but we got a lot of work to do to prove that. So to sum up, uh, and uh, I will then take uh, questions as long as time permits, I uh, identify a few lessons that I've learned from the 20 years of running real, more generally the 30 years uh, since uh, 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 leaving, 31 years since leaving Yale, or the 33 years since starting my first company. Uh, first is, that, of course, that startups are hard. Uh, they're not for the faint of heart, they're, um, uh, they're not trivial, um, and they have a very uh, statistically low success rate, uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not worth doing, because they can be very rewarding in all kinds of ways. Um, psychologically, the sense of building something, the sense of camaraderie that comes from team working together, the feeling of empowerment, the feeling of making a difference in the world, all that stuff, remarkable, independent of any financial benefits, which can also come. Pivoting and turnarounds are also hard. Uh, it's hard to say which is, which is easier, which is harder. Uh, Real Networks was an example of a company that we hit on our first uh, iteration, so we didn't have the slog 
that a lot of startups have. Uh, but uh, if you look at the, across the base of startups, uh, you know, a lot of them, you know, Odeo Twitter is a great example of a company that was basically a failed company that pivoted to a, to a different, more successful model. Uh, there's the, the, a lot of times people start on something, it takes time, uh, then they iterate. So I would say both are hard, and I'm not sure one's harder than the other. The one thing about a turnaround or a pivot that's a little harder is you have the higher risk of distractions because you've got all this legacy stuff around you. That's probably the biggest difference. I would say, having said that, both of them require some core attributes, and the five that I identify that I think are central to any big success are at least one great idea. And uh, that is to say, you can have more than one great idea, but if you have zero great ideas, you're not going to build a huge success. And, and it, it's, it's a very judgmental thing to say, because sometimes you don't know if something's a good idea uh, in, in, in a great idea in theory, but a bad idea in practice, uh, if something sounds good, uh, if something is a great idea, but someone else beats you the punch. So, but a great idea is a central foundation. Second, obviously, you've got to have massive passion for it. One of the things that I always look for when I do angel investing, I'm less active now, I just do a few things a year, but, uh, but in the period when I was stepped away from running real, I was more active. I became a venture partner at Excel, who were the VC firm that backed real, and uh, so I worked with those guys. And they're, they're super smart, and to a person, one of the things they, that they always look for, and I always look for, was just passion for the people that you know, have that run through wall passion about what they're doing. Uh, and not just the, the one individual, but the team of leaders that are setting the tone and the culture of the company. Uh, the third thing, which is different than passion, although often correlates, but not always, is persistence in the face of setbacks. I've met some passionate people that just really weren't persistent. They go, they're passionate, but when they hit a wall, they bounce off the wall and they go in a different direction. Sometimes you gotta really figure out, okay, where's the piece in that wall that I can break through? Sometimes you gotta go around the wall, sometimes you gotta go over it or under it. But a lot of times I've found that what differentiates successful entrepreneurs from unsuccessful isn't the passion, it's the persistence in the face of passion, in the, in the face of persistence, and maintaining that persistence, and obviously maintaining the passion uh, that drove you there. Uh, the fourth point I would say is the resources that enable you to uh, 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 maintain the persistence. And that's obviously not, doesn't mean you have to have a massive amount of money. In fact, I think one of the things that can happen in bubble environments is companies can get overcapitalized. By that I mean they get sloppy and they lose their discipline and they lose their focus, uh, and they're not focusing on the key metrics of what is gonna drive their business to be successful. So I think you have, but you have to have adequate resources so that you can persist. Uh, and maybe you have to hunker down and uh, maybe you can make a team smaller in the face of resistance, but you gotta still have the ability to get through the chasm and get to the other side. And the fifth point that I'd make uh, is teamwork and collaboration, uh, which is, it, these are buzzwords in a way, but they're obviously stunningly important. Uh, I uh, uh, talked to Bing uh, after, uh, uh, after his session, and I've heard him say, which I believe he said here, which I was on the slides, and he and I talked about it, that one of the things he thinks is characteristics of Yale alums is a, a, an orientation towards collaboration and teamwork, and whether it's a, um, a part, of, part of the educational process we all went through, whether it's self-selection on the front end of the funnel. Uh, I don't know if I'd narrowly say that I see that as like a black and white attribute of every Yale entrepreneur I've met or Yale grads that I've worked with in business, uh, but it certainly is something that I think can be undervalued when you get people who are used to super high achievement, uh, you know, in a place like uh, Yale or Harvard, Stanford, or any of these super difficult to get into schools, you typically get in there on the basis of individual achievement. But uh, commercial success and team is, is almost always dominantly driven by team success. Um, and so when I look to, to uh, uh, recruit and interview people, you know, if somebody's, um, the only first person pronoun they use is I and they ever use we, uh, that's a red flag for me. Uh, and in doing vetting and reference checking, you know, if we, if we hear that, you know, someone is really smart, but they didn't work well with other people, that's almost always a, a red flag that, that will slow them down or even prevent them from being hired. So I would say that this set of attributes, I think, are core to any success, be it a, a startup success, be it an entrepreneur success, or a pivot or a turnaround. Uh, so with that, I hope you found that uh, a, a recent, reasonable summary of 35 years of life experience and 20 years in real networks, uh, and happy to take uh, questions as time permits. Start the front. This question is, is going to be weirdly specific, but I was heavily involved in digital audio and video from 2000 to about 2005, and I think somewhere in their real alternative came out, which, uh, as I recall, kind of forcibly decoupled your codec from the real player. 
Uh, was that something where you know, all of a sudden you were thinking winning on the back end was not even winning for the clients? How far did it not even show up on your desk? So uh, our codec, uh, for those of you that didn't live this world, was one of the ways we bootstrapped because there were no good ways to stream audio at modem bit rates in the very beginning period of time. So there was a, there was a need to invent technology. We recognized in the long term, once the industry grew, that would stabilize. So what ended up happening more to decouple our front end and our back end businesses was the um, uh, was two things, frankly. It was the, it was the rise of standardization, uh, the MPEG and the H.264 standards that grew. grew. And second, uh, the fact that uh, Microsoft, uh, when they were competing with us, uh, went to computer manufacturers and went to uh, uh, content companies and paid them not to use our technology and to only use their technology. So there was sort of a, a forced decoupling uh, through uh, checkbook diplomacy, let's say. So, uh, so in that context, uh, the, the, there was an, sort of an inevitability of the decoupling and some, some market things to sell, accelerated it. The only market where clones of the real technology had a specific effect on us uh, of note were China. And weirdly enough, that cut a few different ways. The disadvantage is people have stolen our code. They didn't bother like doing a clean implementation. They just literally stole our code. We proven in courts in China that it's our code, um, and the penalty is like 19 cents or something. <laughs> so uh, it's, it has not been an effective way for us to to beat back consumer companies that, that take our software, put it in old wine in new bottles, or put our code in, in a new vessel and sell it as their own. It has helped us, however, by making our software, our codec, super prevalent in China. Uh, the real format in terms of market share in China, it's the number one market in terms of market share we have in the world today. Uh, so when we do deals with legitimate companies like chipset manufacturers, we are the only legitimate source for them licensing. So we have a very nice licensing, technology licensing revenue into consumer electronics devices, mobile phones, et cetera, principally in China because of that piracy. So it kind of cut both ways. But otherwise, it, it, what happened in the rest of the world was more about those other factors. Uh, next question, I'll try not to make it so long. Uh, third row there. Yes, uh, you know, and, and you talk, I was just, you know, just your passion oh, okay. and product uh, innovation, that really comes from, I think, we always really have to have the founders go driving, okay. driving this. But I'm curious, after 20 years, how do you keep that, uh, uh, you know, how do you keep that in business and growing in the whole company so they can continue to develop products? Well, I would say a few things. Um, if I had not taken time away, it would have been harder. Um, and after uh, 15, 16 years when I stepped away, uh, it, it helped me a few, in a few ways sort of rekindle my passion. One, uh, I just had a chance to catch my breath and have a different work-life balance than you have when you're running a company. Uh, second, I was able to spend time learning about things uh, through the dozen or so startups I invested in through being a venture partner at Excel, uh, seeing how the world had changed. So my view of the world was not simply a of incremental extrapolation of what I'd seen before, it was very different. So when the board asked me to come back in 20 months ago, um, I had a very different point of view about what needed to be done. Uh, and therefore, when I approached people, both some in the company, some who had left the company, who had brought back in, and some new to the company, it was kind of a, uh, a, a it's a little bit like, you know, an, a, an old house you used to live in, you come back and you want to renovate it, you sort of know what you liked about the house. You know how you know, beautiful the views were. Uh, you also know where the termites were. Uh, you know where the you know you have you have a, 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 a window that was never quite right. So you might as well just knock it out and start over again. So you have you have knowledge of what was there and kind of why why it might not be quite right. Um, so it's a combination of rekindled passion, new people that we brought in who have new passion, and in some cases people who came back who had a similar type journey to me where they left did other stuff, uh, and we're able to have perspective on it. And then some, we have some, 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 uh, some people that have been long time people, and most of their passion comes from the fact that they're doing bigger jobs. Our general counsel, for instance, is a 13 year uh, real veteran who I made GC. He was one tier down from that when I came back. Um, and he's terrific, and it's his first time being a GC. So he has not been a general counsel for 13 years. He's been a general counsel for a year and a half. Uh, so that, he has passion because he's doing something new. Uh, yeah, question in the second row. Uh, yeah, so you talked a bit about persistence in the face of setbacks, it's not just you know, hitting the wall and bouncing off in the direction of the direction. But uh, sort of on the other side of that, there's having too much persistence and not recognizing that you need to go in that direction. So I was just wondering how you think about that. Uh, well, it's, it, I think it's a trade-off. I think you sort of have to 
uh, you have to approach these things with um, almost a, not a schizophrenia, but a dichotomous view, which is to say your default has to be you know, uh, persistence and energetic focus on how are we going to achieve what we set out to achieve. And then you have to have an opportunity ability to step back and say, hey, are we uh, not achieving what we wanted because uh, it's not going to happen? Are we not achieving what we have because you know, we're, we're achieving four out of the six things we have to do and we have to fix the other two? And then being, being objective about whether the two that, you, that are not happening are easily fixable or hard to fix um, and if those two that aren't going right, if you have a sub, if you have a strategy for you fix one of them, and then you can still be successful. So it's a combination of you really have to bring that 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 persistence uh, to the to the table almost all the time. But then you have to have a, a willingness to step back periodically. Uh, Andy Grove, uh, the former CEO of Intel, uh, wrote a few books about management, and he called these things strategic inflection points, which is where you have to be willing to step back and say, is this going the right? Is the world changing? What do we do? Um, and uh, I recommend his books as great examples uh, of uh, two or three different books. You can just Google that phrase, uh, and there are one or two books with that concept figures in prominently. There, he wrote several good ones, but those are among the best. Um, so, so it's it's more art than science, but there is a you can be methodical in stepping back and forcing yourself to step back. You know, I don't know if it's every three months or something. Not to have the whole organization step back, but just you know, selectively pick areas where there's reason to double check, and you and you do that uh, vigorously, but typically only for a short period of time. Yeah? Uh, whenever you have great product uh, organizations or technology organizations, you get great expansion of ideas and uh, go into lots of different areas that maybe you wouldn't have seen previously. How do you overlay the market opportunity or the market demand to keep people focused enough? Uh, well, there's always, there's always, to me, a, that's one of the art more than science things. So how do you actually connect opportunities for innovation with understanding where markets are going? Um, I mean, it's, it's you can quote Wayne Gretzky all you want, you know, the famous quote of, you know, you know why, why are you so much better than anyone else? Which is, well, I don't go where the puck is, I go where the puck is going. So you can say, hey, the answer is you go where the puck is going. But you only know in hindsight whether you went where the puck was really going or whether you went where you thought the puck should have gone, but it didn't end up going that way. Uh, I always tell people, one of, one of the things to, to, uh, that, that I always uh, emphasize is the role uh, that timing plays uh, in any of these market developments. So, and so it, you could say that, you could say it's another saying, luck of timing. When we launched Real Audio in April of 95, it was fantastically lucky timing because people were just starting to see the commercial internet as a possibility. So if we launched it two years later, maybe even a year later, certainly three years later, we wouldn't have been first. And as a startup, if you're not first, it's odds are good you're not going to be relevant. You're not going to have the kind of rocket ship ride that we had. So um, I would say that the uh, X factor that often determines the difference between you've got the right intersection point between technology and market and you don't is the timing of when you bring that product to market. I know there's been a lot of talk in the mobile era about MVPs, minimum viable products, uh, as a way to probe and test. Um, I'm not a pure believer in MVPs. I'm a selective believer in MVPs. Sometimes MVPs that are crap experiences give you uh, 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 a, a false negative on an idea. Um, and sometimes if you, if you rush into something and you don't implement it in a way that's great, uh, you can you can hit that. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, you know take take something like I mean, it's a massive obviously financial success from an investor standpoint. WhatsApp, right? WhatsApp was an example of a product that did something in a way that it was very obvious to do, which is just use IP as a means of of, uh, of creating a network effect around messaging uh, and driving it up to massive scale. There were a dozen companies, maybe fifty companies, maybe a thousand companies that were trying to do something in messaging. WhatsApp did a better job than just about any startup in making the experience so good uh, and making the use of it so friction-free uh, that, that it just kind of grew and grew and grew and grew uh, and it, it let the natural virality of that mob that take off. Uh, but but the, the, the other 49 that didn't become WhatsApps um, and, you know, and the other 43 that didn't become much of anything at all only got, only got one or two things wrong uh, maybe they didn't have the reliability right. Maybe their UI was too hard to use. Maybe their pricing model was wrong. But you, you know, these markets are so Darwinian. 
you know, an idea like that, which is very horizontal, it's very unlikely that there'll be uh, that that there'll be more than a small fraction of people that enter that will get enough of those pieces right, and they'll just the other ones that had the right idea just won't hit it quite right. So we'll just do one final question. Yeah. Uh, any uh, in the spirit of Mitch Caper is not here. Any women who haven't asked questions who'd like to? Uh, I can't see gender from that, but okay, okay. okay. great. Uh, how did I know that it was the right time to leave Microsoft? It's an excellent question. Uh, of course I didn't. Um, but I knew that it was the right time for me. Uh, I've been at Microsoft at the time almost 10 years. Uh, and I had a fantastic ride. When I got there, it was about 250 people. As I mentioned, uh, about 50 million in revenue. When I left, uh, it was thousands of employees. Uh, and uh, it was getting close to 10 years. And I sort of figured in my head, and it's not like written down anywhere, that, after a while, something becomes what you're doing with your life, unless you make a change. Uh, and I didn't have any uh, uh, financial uh, impediments to prevent me from making a change. My health was good. I didn't have kids. My parents' health was good. I didn't have any of the things that might prevent you from plunging all into a startup. Um, I didn't know that the internet was coming. In fact, when I first started, longer story than time for today, but uh, I was equally focused on uh, the dial-up co connectivity world that I knew something about, uh, and, I, and also the world of interactive television, and I spent time about six months probing each of them. So I was hopeful that it was a sea change, but I didn't know. The, the aha moment for me actually came Memorial Day weekend, 19, uh, 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 1993, when I went to an Electronic Front uh, Frontier Foundation uh, board meeting in Austin, Texas. Mitch Caper, who's a good friend of mine, invited me to it. Uh, and a guy on the board named Dave Fargo, who truly is one of the fathers of the internet, gathered us all around the table and said, have you ever seen this mosaic thing? I had not. It was an early version of the NCSA mosaic web browser that Mark Andreessen and his band of young pirates at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana were working on that had just been released into the wild. It was very simple, very primitive. The best thing that I had on top of it, it ran on Windows, uh, but it also had and Macs, and it had a, a tag for images in it. And so literally upon seeing that, I was like, wow, if we could do the same thing for audio and video uh, that that thing does for images uh, and text, we could have to do something amazing. And so it was literally, I was in the right place at the right time. It was after I had basically left Microsoft, about three months after, I took a couple months traveling abroad, came back, and through a, a brilliant friend uh, who had a you know, very creative group of people in a nonprofit context that I discovered the proto-commercial internet. So, Again, if you always have to choose between being lucky and good, uh, pick lucky every time. Great. Thank you very much.